What did Jesus mean by turning the other cheek? All right, so today uh, on the episode, we're going to discuss what did Jesus mean uh, in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount where he talked about turning the other cheek. And so, um, I mean, guys, is Jesus saying that you should be a glutton for punishment and just get slapped all the time? Or is is he sharing something deeper and, and uh, something more, something deeper? The first one. The first one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just no, he's definitely, wrong answer. Definitely something deeper. Wrong answer. Um, definitely something. How we should respond to people who hurt us. I think you're right. I yeah. think you're right. Although in a sense, he is saying if someone slaps you, you should turn to the cheek, which sort of like counterintuitive, at least to like how the way we've been raised, you know, I've been raised like if somebody it's like, I'm a Christian, but if somebody slaps me, that guy's going to get slapped back or, yeah. you know, yeah. or I'll just say like, Hey buddy, leave me alone. I'm not going to let him strike the other one. But it's basically like you're saying about how to respond. Yeah. I think a lot of the people that were listening to him um, probably had a tendency to do more than what an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth yep. backed up. Yeah. They were going to escalate the issue. Yeah. So going <laughs> the other direction is going to bring things back down, you know? It's funny. It's funny how you say. Sometimes we talk about the notes before, and sometimes we just kind of pull up the notes and sort of wing it. And this one, we're sort of winging it a little bit. We have notes, but I mean, yeah. it's like not like we're saying, hey, we didn't even them. study." <laughs> but we're saying, "No." But I'm saying what you just said about escalation of force is not in our notes. But then I have written in my Bible, escalation of force. Christians should not be a retaliatory people, not a people who retaliate and want to get revenge, which is kind of yeah. like what you just said. And we didn't talk about that part. Yeah, it's more like you slap me in the face. So the reaction for the people. Who we're hearing it at this time. Some of them would have just dropped the nuclear bomb on them yeah. and all their family. I mean, it's yeah. just, there was no, it was, it was, it's to correct their lack of justice. Yeah. Well, that actually reminds me of the sons of thunder. Who were the sons of thunder? Was that James, James and John? John. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Mark three seventeen. James, the son of Zebedee and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bow Energies, oh, yeah. which yeah. is Sons of Thunder. That's and the reference. I believe the reference to what I don't know that it's kind of like you impl- It's uh, you can sort of put two and two together. And I think Matt Mark calls them the Sons of Thunder because in Luke nine fifty four, <laughs> when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, "Lord, do you want us to come to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just like Elijah <laughs> did?" <laughs> like. And I can only imagine Jesus, he turned to them and said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are. For the yeah. son of man did not come to destroy lives, men's lives, but to save them. And like most people would say, yeah, but they didn't receive him. Like the people, the Samaritans didn't receive Jesus. And so they're like, Lord, do you want us to take care of these people like Elijah did? We'll call down fire from heaven. And Jesus is like, no, the guys, that's not. So like even Jesus realized his mission, it was a higher purpose, yeah. you know, um, so, yeah, that just always makes me think of that story. Well, this whole uh, scripture that we're talking about comes from Matthew 5, 38 through 40. Cough into the mic. It works better. I'm trying to turn away. <laughs> I'm just joking. He's turning the other cheek here. He's turning the other cheek <laughs> when you need to cough. That's smart. Bear Good with job. one another. Okay? That's right. And so fulfill the law of Christ. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was, okay. I was thinking you mean when you cough, I'll 13. But, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, all right, love Tucker. bears all things. Love bears all things. That's true. All right. You were saying, Tucker. So, okay. Back to the Bible. Oh. Um, <laughs> He had heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Did you but, say that where you're reading from? Oh, yeah. Matthew 5, 38 through 40. You may have. I just probably was then talking to Scott. He started turning the other Okay, team. okay. Matthew but I tell five. you, in 39, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. Um, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him let him have your clo- cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to, give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Okay. So, yeah, let's go through that. Like Scott said, you've heard it was said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I think that's from Leviticus 24. I think Leviticus 24 talks about that sort of principle. And so Jesus has said, hey, you've heard this, but I'm yeah. giving you like a higher law, right? I'm, I'm basically giving you a a, a higher calling, yeah, right? Yeah, that's Leviticus 24, 20. Okay. And I think it's found in Exodus and Deuteronomy as well. Okay, cool. Awesome. And then he says, I tell you not to resist an evil person. What's that word resist mean? It means to set against, um, an example, withstand, and then it also breaks down undamaged or unaffected. So it almost sounds like not trying to like fight back, you know, yeah. like if someone's doing evil, it's almost kind of like just like, all right, let them, let them do what they're going to do. You know, it almost makes me think of the proverb, which I can never remember. I always get it mixed up, but my dad always taught me this proverb like heavily, which is that a soft answer turns away wrath. Yeah. You know, like if you've ever, 
if you've ever had somebody like get up in your face or get mad at you, or even just like try to argue with you. And you know, you respond by saying like, you know what, buddy, I'll tell you what, how does that go? It Not just good. escalates it. Whereas if you're like, you know what, man, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, know completely surprised yeah. them probably. I remember before I came to GBN uh, for like 10 years, I was in um, biotech, like robotics consulting stuff. And I remember the, I had to go visit the state department of health with Pen in Pennsylvania. That was one of my clients. And so, you know, I'm fresh out of, you know, like college and went through training, very little training. And so I remember like the day before I had this big meeting with like, you know, seven or eight people in a boardroom with its tenant or the Pennsylvania department of health about one of our instruments. And so like my boss, like the day before I went in, he was like, Hey, just a heads up. Uh, they are having problems with our instrument and they, um, they really don't like us. And I'm like, great. <laughs> you know, and I don't really know that much. I was still new to like learning about the equipment. So I was like, what am I going to do? So I remember I went in and basically sat down and started off the conversation. I said, listen, I know that you all are not happy with us. I know that our instrument has not been performing well. Like I'm here today that you can just like unleash and tell me all your feelings. Let me know. And I will do my best to write it down and correct the problem. And it like totally disarmed them. <laughs> Because it was like, I think they were expecting me to try to argue with them or try to fight back. Tell them, no, really, it's just that you're dumb. You don't know how to use it. <laughs> Our instrument's great. You yeah. just don't know it, yeah, which I don't think was the case. I think the instrument did have actual problems, you yeah. know. But yeah, like, it was that idea of like not trying to fight back and not not, not having the motivation of I'm going to win the argument. I'm going to win the confrontation. But more of just like, I'm going to try to be a peacemaker. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of a lot of what this, this has is you don't need to resist them, you know. And um, yeah. Yeah. And if you do that, a lot of times things go a lot, a lot smoother. So, um, all right. What about the next part? Let's read it. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. It's kind of a hard one, isn't it? Yeah. What, what, what as Americans were like, <clears throat> Oh, you assume me, I'll sue you. Yeah. You know, or if you want to take my cloak, okay, well, I'm going to fight you for that cloak, but maybe if you get my cloak, I'm not going to give yeah, you my tunic. You're not going to take mine. It's no, my thing. Yeah. I wonder too, if that, idea is like if you have the if you keep the bigger picture in mind like i know this may be even hard to practice but like you know if somebody comes at you and wants one of your possessions right and you're trying to fight them if you remember that the bigger purpose is for you to convert their what yeah. soul, soul maybe that's the idea of look like if they're going to fight you and you say look i don't even care about that like maybe they'll they'll probably think you're a weirdo want to know why you're different like why yeah. did you give me that you know it's like someone steals your jacket and you're like here, take this scarf with me. I you say my pants. Like, no, not your pants. <laughs> not scarf. Pants. Yeah, here's, yeah. Yeah, jacket. Here's my scarf, right? Because that's appropriate, right? But yeah, like, it makes you wonder why. And the next one I think is kind of cool. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. I, I have my, in my notes somewhere. Like, I have different notes in different Bibles, and I don't know where it is. But I think I read somewhere that, like, in the Roman world, that you were like the Roman soldier could ask any citizen to carry their things like yeah, a mile and like outside the city on the roads, there was like hmm. a mile marker. So like the Roman soldier could ask you, you know, if I'm a Roman soldier, Hey, you, I need you to carry my armor for me a mile. And so you're supposed to carry it a mile. And so you get close to the mile and the Roman soldier is like, all right, well, I'm gonna have to carry my own stuff now. And then you get to the mile marker and you're like, Hey man, no, it's good. I'll go another mile with you. And the soldier's like, what? Like, hmm. You're going to, yeah, I'm happy. Like, I'll help you out, man. And it's a long walk. That guy's going to be like, wow, I like this guy. You know, like you're basically it's service. It's like an attitude of service. And who knows what that might lead to, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. an attitude that says, you know what? Um, I'm going to do more than is expected of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of these things seem so backward in today's culture. Like you, <clears throat> like you just, your human instinct, you like, you don't, you wouldn't want to do that. Like, why would I want to bless my enemy? Why would I want yeah. to love him like that or take care of him? Yep. But like I said, ultimately, it's about our soul and kind of pointing people back to the gospel and everything. Yeah, absolutely. The next verse, give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Yeah. Isn't that hard sometimes? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, it's easy to go, you know, sometimes it's easy to talk through this, like the doctrinal stuff and say, well, this is what it says and blah, blah, blah. But when you get to like the real life application, you're just like, yep. It's like, does that I mean, sometimes everything? you're like, yeah, yeah. We're supposed, when someone wants to borrow, I'm supposed to give it to him. And then someone comes to your house and asks to borrow. You're like, yeah, I'm using that or, yeah, you know, uh, I mean, these, this is stuff. Yeah. I'm same here. It's like kind of steps on your toes. Like, well, it's like James. It's like, look, that's great. If you know it, 
But unless you what? Put it into practice. Yeah. Unless you do it. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's knowing it, but not doing it. It's like not, that's, that's not worth anything, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is why we need, we need that savior because a lot of the stuff I've, I know I failed with before. Sure. You need Absolutely. to do better with that. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is, this is important, just as important as all the other topics we talked about. Yeah. You know, this is, this is the law of God too. Yeah. We got to learn how to do this, do this better. Agreed. Look at the next verse, verse 43. For you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. <coughs> but I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, do you what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do that? Therefore, you shall be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. So that first part, love your enemy. You've heard that you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But he says, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And why? So that you can be sons of of your father in heaven. I heard a story recently. I forget where I was. Sometimes when I travel, whether it's to like do like a seminar or a gospel meeting or speak somewhere, you know, I end up spending a lot of time with preachers and their families and, and uh, elders. And, you know, we'll get talking about so-and-so and they'll tell me stories about old preachers. And I remember somebody recently told me a story about um, Marshall Keeble and uh, Marshall Keeble was, I don't know really the dates, but I mean like fifties, I think forties, fifties. Um, and so anyway, I mean, he preached for a long time, but I think this story took place maybe in the 40s, 50s, 60s, but it was during the civil <laughs> rights movement. Marshall Keeble was African-American preacher, right? And he yeah. was with a white preacher and they were traveling together, preaching together like they're brethren. They didn't look at each other as like white and black. I mean, they obviously knew what color the skin was, but they were looking at more as like you know, shades of brown. Like, but they were looking at it as like their brethren, right? Mm -hmm. And they went to like a, either a restaurant or a hotel and they went in and the lady or guy who worked there said like, oh, he can't stay here. To brother Keeble, mm. right? And so brother Keeble was like, it's okay. I'll go outside. And so the other white, you know, white preacher, he was like trying to argue with them, not argue, but discuss with them. Hey, look, let him stay here. He can stay with me. Like we're, you know, we're brethren, we're preaching together. And apparently the story was that he, the lady said, or guy said no. And so he went outside to talk to Marshall Keeble. And when he got outside, Marshall Keeble was praying for the, the guy. Mm. Like Marshall Keeble, who'd just been told, no, you can't come in here because you're African-American. He was outside praying for the guy who just like spitefully said, no, you can't stay here. Like that's an example of it. That's a perfect picture of it. You know, like yeah. when everybody else in the world and your whole being is telling you like, this is unjust, which it was, and you should be retaliating yeah. and fighting. He's praying for that person. I'm trying right? to think about, you know, um, the jailer. I mean, what was it? The Philippian that, jailer. Yeah. That Paul and the, when they went in they were, I know they sang. I yeah. can't remember. Does it to say that they were praying as well? Could they have been praying for them? I don't know. I don't know. And, uh, and, uh, act 16. Yeah, I'd go look that up. But. Yeah. I don't know. But I mean, you know, Jesus, <coughs> what did Jesus say on the cross? Father, forgive them. Yeah. Yeah. They, they know not what they do. Yeah. And in act seven, Stephen, as he's being stoned and drug out of the city, he says, Lord, not lay this, lay not this sin to their charge. Yeah. It was very similar. Yeah. To what Jesus said. Yeah. I don't think I'd be saying that which is wrong with me because it would be a really tough pill to swallow. Well, and it's like, it's just such a difficult situation, you know, like, I think that's one of the reasons why getting in scripture and like, you know, hiding in your heart, yeah. memorizing it. And then keeping perspective. Yeah. I think that make it easy too. Yeah. You remember, and if you're like Stephen and you remember, hey, you know what? It's going to hurt, mm -hmm. but um, I'm about to go to my reward. Yeah. And they're about to live however long God allows them to live on this earth mm -hmm. with this guilt on them. If they don't fix it. Mm -hmm. uh I'll, I'll never see them again. Yeah. Didn't know? Jesus stand up? Wasn't that, wasn't Yeah. In Acts 7. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about Stephen. Yeah. yeah. Then he, yeah. he, he saw, Stephen saw Jesus stand up. Yeah. Acts 7. Well, More of up. like a, uh, he looked up. No, he right. saw Stephen, Stephen stand up. <clears throat> yeah. I yeah. think, and the reason was, wasn't it more of like, I'll read it. out of respect. Are you saying, oh, go ahead. Yeah. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. This is after Stephen starts preaching the sermon in chapter six and seven. And then yeah. he, he gets really um, <laughs> diplomatic and says, you stiff neck and uncircumcised and hardened ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Well, how they resist the Holy Spirit? Because he'd been preaching. They resisted the words. 
as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, that's Christ, of whom you now have become betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they, the Jews who speaking to, heard these things, they were cut to the heart, but not like Acts 2, where they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They gnashed their teeth, gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Usually, I think he's always sitting. Well, I mean, like, yeah, Acts 2, it says Jesus was seated at the right hand of God. I, I sort of look at it the same way you do, which is, why is Jesus standing? Like, was it Jesus standing, like, out of a sign of respect for the first martyr to die? I mean, hmm. you know, I don't know. Yeah. And Someone once taught me that, and I was like, <clears throat> "Yeah." And he said, "And and said Stephen standing saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God.' Right? Then they cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was mm-hmm. calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit." Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Mm -hmm. That's where we get introduced to Saul, right? That's right. That's the first place you see Saul. So I always wonder if Saul was like at the death or at the, at the trial of Christ, you know, the whole Sanhedrin's gathered and Galatians one says Paul was advancing. Yep. And Uh he was son of studying under Gamaliel. (coughs) He was advancing beyond all those in Phariseeism, you know, Galatians one 14, I think says. Yeah. So he was like cream of the crop. In Jerusalem, I'm guessing. So my thought would be, was he in the back corner when they were trying Christ? I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah. Who knows? Even if he wasn't there that night, he would have known. I'm sure he would have. Yeah. Yeah. So he likely would have been there in the crowd that day. Yeah. He was in Jerusalem. Exactly. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the Authentic Christian Podcast. This podcast has been sponsored by GBN, Gospel Broadcasting Network. You can download the app and start streaming every show, watch every episode, and discover the answers to life's biggest questions today. So, you know, like when you look at the way that certain people in the Bible handled themselves, if you remember those stories, maybe there'll come a day where we're being faced with that. Maybe one day it'll be illegal to preach on certain things and We'll preach on it and maybe they'll march into the studio. I mean, I don't know that I think that and, and basically okay. smack us. And what are we going to do? Are we going to say like, you know, we're going to rebel or are we just going to say like, okay, you know, yeah. and try to be passive, you know, you do think about the fact that like in Acts 16, you brought up the jailer, the fact that they ended up in prison, they were able to do good things there. Yeah. You know, maybe that's the attitude of like, look, if I just trust God and do what he says, God will give me, provide opportunities for me, whether it's in prison or not, you know. Well, they went the second mile because, you know, the earthquake came. Yeah. And they, and the, the prison guard thought, oh man, they're going to escape. Yeah. But they just st- stayed there. Yeah. And it showed them the gospel eventually. Absolutely. You know, the Bible talks a lot about how we should respond to our enemies. I mean, different passages say if your enemy is hungry, what should you do? Feed them. Yep. What else? Is that Matthew 5? Uh, if he's naked, clothe him. I mean, Proverbs 25, Proverbs 25, 21. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Like, I mean, you've got Matthew 25, but um, Romans 12, 20 talks about it too. But I'm thinking of Proverbs 25, 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. So this was even, this was a principle in the Old Testament. Yeah. Right. Um, But a lot of things they'd lost sight of. And so Jesus had basically said, hey, you've heard that you're allowed to hate your enemies. I mean, that's not what, that's not what Proverbs said. Right. Um, Romans 12, 20. What's that say? Do you have it? No, I was back in Matthew 5. Look at the Proverbs Beatitudes. Proverbs 12, 20. Okay, we'll says, go. Well, whatever. Go for it. But, oh. Go to read, read Romans therefore, 12, 20. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Yeah, and in verse 19, it says, <clears throat> don't avenge yourselves. Like, don't seek revenge. Give place to wrath for its written vengeance is mine. So it's yeah. basically saying, look, you just do what you're supposed to do. You treat people good. You turn the other cheek when they strike you and you leave vengeance up to God, yeah. right? And so when someone's, your enemy's hungry, you feed him. When he's thirsty, you give him drink. And in doing so, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. That doesn't mean you should wish for somebody to go to hell, but it means like, look, God's going to handle the what? He's but going to handle the vengeance. God's going to handle it. Yeah. God's going to handle the vengeance. He's going to handle the judgment. Earlier today, uh, yeah. that passage, yeah. a passage came up. What yeah. was it? Come again? I don't know. I know oh. you're talking about how 
like let's say someone did something wrong to you, yeah, but then you talking. responded, then you're not giving vengeance to God, and He's not going to take vengeance back on that person that did you wrong. I'll think of it. I, I know was I part about. of that conversation. Yeah, hmm. mm-hmm. I think I might have it in here. Well, you got you got Matthew five, but I got Matthew five. Is that what you're talking about right now? But yeah, I think read that. that read wherever you're at. What verse is that? But this is the Beatitudes. Okay, and oh, you know, seeing the multitudes, you know, he Jesus went up on a mountain, and when he was seated. When, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him and then he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful for, the, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness in his sake for theirs is the kingdom of God. And then 11, sure. um, but blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, which goes back to Jesus' trial. Yeah. Well, a foreshadow, but I guess. Yeah. But rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who are before you. That's great. Mm. Yeah, I can't, um, I can't think of it exactly, but the idea was, you know, people are going to be persecuted and mistreated here. After this is over, God is going to take care of us. Oh, flip flopping. Well, I I talked about Second Thessalonians one. That may be it. Where it basically said it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Yeah, yeah. That where, sounds right. Yeah, where it basically talks about the people who are persecuted on earth. One day God's going to handle it, right. and He's going to turn the troublers now into the troubled. Like He's yeah. going to punish them. That's and God it. says it's a righteous thing. That's yeah, we were talking. We talked about that during the hell episode. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you know, I, I think it's interesting like in, um, you know, the Beatitudes. It's, it's focusing a lot on spiritual things. You know, so like, blessed are the poor in spirit. I think that's talking about the people who are relying on God, the mm-hmm. humble people. Those are the kind of people that are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn. I think it's mourning over their sins. It's not saying like, if you just cry all the time, if you're just a sad person, but it's those who mourn what? Spiritually over their sins, they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? They're all spiritual characteristics, right? And then verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say evil things against you falsely, obviously mm-hmm. not like they say evil because you're doing evil. That's not the same thing, but rejoice for great is your, your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets before you. So it's this idea of like, even whenever you're persecuted, you should turn the other cheek and rejoice yeah. because in a sense you're like, it's treasure in heaven. You're building up treasure in heaven, yeah. you know? It's like the story in Acts 5, 40 and 41, where they're, <laughs> the story cracks me up. I don't know. I think stuff sometimes is like awesome. And I say, it's like funny, you know, it's not like, I think it's funny that they got beat, but the way they rejoiced. So Acts 5, uh, 40, they agreed with them and they called for the apostles and beat them. They commanded them, the apostles, they should speak no more in the name of Jesus and let them go. Oh, yeah. So they yeah. D- departed from the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for his name. And daily in the temple in every house, they did not cease singing and teaching and preaching as Jesus as the Christ. You know, so like the result, six, seven, there are many priests that even obeyed the gospel. So they were told, don't preach. And they said, look, we're going to preach. They were beat for it. They rejoiced and they kept preaching. Like they didn't give up on their mission, you know. Yeah, that's um, that's John 15, right? Where he talks about... um Servant is not above his master. Um, if they persecute me. And yeah, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Yeah. Yeah, that might be. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe I got that wrong. Well, I mean, the principle, wherever you, I mean, I, when I read like Paul's epistles, you know, he normally quotes Old Testament, but he doesn't say like in Isaiah 53 and verse six, you know, because sure. he didn't have it. So if you just remember the concept, I'm okay with that. But yeah, I mean, the Bible talks over and over that Christians are going to face persecution. It's kind of like, I guess just be prepared for it. Like, if you're prepared for it and you expect it to happen and you already have set up in your mind how you're going to respond, it's a lot easier, right? Mm-hmm. Whether, I mean, most of the time it's slander now. You know, like most of the time, if you want to say that the, I don't even want to use the word persecute. That's what it is, but it's very, very minor for us. It's like people slandering us. People saying, yeah, here in the you know, US. they believe this, they believe this, they teach this and they blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, we don't teach that. We've never said that, right? That's the yeah. That's like the extent right now that we face, you know? For the most part. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we could get into some uh, interesting discussions about things, but uh, we'll do that maybe on another episode. Sure. That's probably, I have no idea what you're talking about. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah. We'll discuss it off camera. We'll first that. We'll first that. Okay. Later. Yeah. Okay. No, it's, it's a different show I think we're planning to do. Okay. Okay. Um, but you know, in Second Timothy, 
3, uh, 10 through 15, Paul was writing to Timothy and he was trying to, he was warning him. I don't that, know that one right now off the top of my head, so read it. <clears throat> this time I'm just Christians and we'll, we're going to face persecution. Okay. What did you say? 2 Timothy 3? Yeah, 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 15. Um, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, mm. persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, mm -hmm. <clears throat> at Lystra, or that's where Lystra. I mean, that's where that's Acts fourteen, where he was like stoned to death almost. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what per, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and and all who desire to live mm -hmm. godly in Christ will suffer persecution. Mm -hmm. But evil man and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So he basically says, like, all the things that I endured. Go to Second Corinthians 11. We've probably looked at this. You know, when you do a podcast, when you're like up like 60 or 70 episodes, like I'm sure we've talked about some of these same passages over and over, but. Yeah, I mean that's sort of natural. All the the suffering that Paul went through. Um, somebody read Second Corinthians eleven twenty two through thirty three. It's a long section of scripture, but just listen to all the stuff Paul endured. All right, suffering for Christ. You got it. Come Are on. they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Hey, this is where he's got false teachers that are accusing him of things, and so he's basically saying. I'm just like, I'm an, a Hebrew, I'm an Israelite, I'm seed of Abraham, but then he's going to say there are things I suffered they didn't suffer. So Yeah. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And what he's saying is, you know. Like, yeah. If they're a minister, questions. I'm a real, you know. That, yeah. Um, I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside the other things, what comes upon me daily? My deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? You want me to stop there or keep going? Keep going. Uh, if I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascus. How do you say that? Damascenes? Damascenes. Damascenes. Damascus yeah. people. Yeah, close enough. Yeah. In a garrison, desiring to arrest me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. So, like, he, he like, was running and, you know, like, shipwrecked. I mean, a lot of, he was, like, uh, what do you say? A, a day and night in the deep? He's, like, treading water, probably yeah, like was, on shipwreck. He was probably worse than homeless and lost. Because he was also persecuted through that process. All I mean, like he had nothing. Yeah, you look at all the things he went through. Yeah, and he's able to basically write some of the things. That and he when wrote. I say lost, I don't mean spiritually. I no, mean no, it's course. like he literally has nothing. He's out in the wilderness. Yeah, he's in the middle of the sea. Yeah, and he's starving and he's thirsty and yeah. people are beating him and stoning him and trying to kill him. Yeah, he's been through it. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so, what are some thoughts that we can think about? Number one, I got a couple. Whenever we think about, I guess, turn to the cheek, one thought that Tucker wrote down, Tucker wrote some thoughts to ponder. Who are we to think we deserve the right to punish those that wrong us? Which is true. Like sometimes a lot of the thoughts we have come from this arrogant mindset of like, well, you know who I am? Yeah, I can't believe you did that to me, to, to Aaron, to Tucker, to Scott Ingram. Mm. You did that to us. You know who we are? We got a podcast. <laughs> who cares? Right? Like yeah. that doesn't mean anything. And so we need, as people and us specifically, we need to be, like, look, we don't deserve the right to punish people that wrong us. That's God. God is the yeah. only one that deserves the right to punish those people. Yeah. You know? I mean, I just think like, who's going to put the other guy on death row in there to, to pull the handle on the other guy on death row. It's mm -hmm. like, you, you're not in any position mm -hmm. to be that one. Really mm -hmm. I understand. There's a role government's play sure, sure. and they don't bear the sword in vain. Yeah. And God allows us certain things, but to protect ourselves and our family too. Mm -hmm. Those are all worthwhile conversations and nuances mm -hmm. at the end of the day. 
we don't have the right to to take that role. Yeah. God's taken it and reserved it for himself. Yep. He, he's the one for vengeance. And you know, when you think about, there's so many, we've said this in so many different like episodes and classes, but like God never asks you to do something that he isn't willing to do himself. Mm -hmm. Like you could never say like, you know, like, oh, well, God doesn't know what X is like because like, no, he experienced everything. And I think it's interesting that Christ is going to be the one that judges, right? Christ is going to be the one that repays. God's going to repay. And yet he's also the one who turned the other cheek if you want to say the biggest example of that was him going through the trial on the cross, mm -hmm. right? This is Isaiah 53, who 700 years before the crucifixion of Christ. Let me read you some of these, uh, some of these things that are prophesying about Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for our peace, like God making peace, him making peace with us and God was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. You talk about the king of turning the other cheek when you're being wrongfully, you know, wrongfully treated. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. That means basically like the, the unrighteous proceedings, like his trial was just so it was a farce. And who will declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his dead. He had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Yet he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, you shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and pleasure. The Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the labor travail of his soul and be satisfied. I mean, it keeps going on, but basically the idea is like, he like a sheep to the a sheep to the slaughter, a lamb to the slaughter is silent. He didn't open his mouth. Like he, you talk about the, the epitome of turning the other cheek repeatedly throughout that whole trial and going to the cross. And he did, he just turned the other cheek because yep. he knew what he was doing was right. And he had a purpose, you know, his purpose. He was looking at the bigger picture. Yeah. Which and is what we need to do. Kept in mind, there's going to be a time and a place for the vengeance. That's right. That's right. So, yep. Yeah, that's right. Well, we're about 31. This is probably the first episode this season that we have not gone like almost an hour. But it's, it's pretty close to yeah. half hour. Yeah. So. But I guess concluding, when people hurt us or persecute us for being a Christian, Jesus commands us to respond with love and goodness and never to repay evil for evil. Mm -hmm. So we should always forgive one another and we can be forgiven. Actually, before we started this episode, we were joking around and yeah. and Scott said, what did you say? Like, like forgive me and i said you are not forgiven and yeah tucker, i don't tucker, remember what it was tucker said then you will not be forgiven <laughs> and i said that's pretty good actually you know we were joking but the point is the way we forgive is how god's going to forgive us yeah and so we should always forgive if that person repents obviously yeah, it's 17. in the model prayer that's right model right. prayer but jesus who was the perfect person who as tucker said could have repaid everyone for evil chose to what love yeah make a chance do good live holy and leave the vengeance yeah. We need to leave the vengeance to God because he's yeah, going to handle we it. We do. Yeah. We're not capable of understanding what needs to really be leveled appropriately no. and right. how to do it. That's right. And oftentimes we don't have the power to do it anyway, so it'll eat us up. No. So we got to leave that to leave it to God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any concluding thoughts? That was it for me. That the, was it. That the was one the verse thought. I was thinking of earlier was like, yeah, <clears throat> look don't it. rejoice when your enemy falls. Yeah. Don't let your heart yeah. be glad because when he, stumble, when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and it displays him and he turns away his wrath from him. Yeah. It's first Peter three, it's nine through 10. It's a good verse, but yeah, that's, my yeah, last we shouldn't rejoice whenever our enemy falls. <clears throat> so ultimately our goal should be to help him see the truth and be saved as well. Yeah. Amen. Don't okay. hate him in your heart. That's right. right. That's exactly Don't right. Murder him. Yep. Okay. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the authentic Christian podcast, where we talk about turning the other cheek. I'm Aaron. This is Scott. This is Tucker. We'll see you back next episode. Have a great day.